This meeting is being recorded. Uh, hello, I'm Kevin Rogers. Uh, I'm the Director of Reusable Faith in Adelaide. And tonight we have a guest who's Dr. Mark Harwood from uh, Creation Ministries International, and he is going to speak on astronomical ev evidence for biblical creation. So thank you, Mark, and I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to the group this evening. Um, I know that as an organisation, you don't espouse a particular position or, in fact, um, the position that I hold regarding our origins. So I'm very grateful that um, uh, you've given me this opportunity to explain why I believe what I believe. I thought I should start with just a little bit about myself. Um, I actually was born in Adelaide, which uh, means that I'm uh, from very good stock, as I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, <laughs> I uh, became a Christian at the age of 10 at a Billy Graham crusade, which was held in Adelaide in the May of 1959. So you've probably now all figured out how old I am. I grew up in a, a Christian household for which I'm immensely grateful. And I grew up though believing that God must have used evolution to create. I was interested in science and wanted to develop uh, my understanding of science and so on, and also to develop in my Christian walk and my biblical worldview. And it seemed to be the logical um, solution to what was the dilemma, not that I really understood the dilemma in really great depth at that stage. But having that kind of view caused me as a young man to not really understand my faith. I can remember clearly uh, wondering why did Jesus have to die for me? What was the point of the cross? And I went to uh, some of the leaders in my church and asked that question. You see, I reasoned like this. Why couldn't Jesus have come, uh, lived a good life, shown us how to relate to our Heavenly Father and then been transfigured up into heaven? Why the cross? What was the point of the cross? And I got various answers um, some people said Jesus identified with us in our sufferings and so on, but it didn't really seem to cut it for me because how did that mean that his death paid the price for all mankind's sin? But it wasn't until actually after my postgraduate work that um, I really was confronted over this whole issue of origins. And I was explaining to Kevin earlier, I was reading a book by Billy Graham called Peace with God. I didn't really have much peace with God, to be honest. And uh, in this uh, book, Billy Graham makes a statement about Adam not being a gibbering caveman, uh, the point being that he was a fully mature, developed, responsible uh, human being who made a decision to rebel against God. And I remember thinking, oh, I felt as though the Lord impressed on me the question, do you believe that? And I think, well, yes, I do. And then I realised that there's a problem here because if that's true, then, as the Bible says, I believe it was Adam's rebellion that brought death and suffering into the world. So if it was in the world beforehand, we are attributing those things to the creator God, which was out of step with how I read his character and his nature, and certainly as a young Christian, how I'd experienced him. So that caused me to go on a bit of a journey and I discovered two things out of it. Firstly, that I could believe that Genesis was actual history. Uh, and I could believe it because I found that you could interpret all of the evidence around us uh, in ways that are consistent with the Genesis record of history. And I also discovered that I should believe it because it actually forms the foundation stone uh, of the whole of the gospel message. So that was really the, the transformation for me. And uh, I guess ever since then, I've been uh, involved in some way to the point where um, I actually became employed by CMI on a part-time ba basis back in 90, uh, sorry, 2005. But I spent uh, my professional life in aerospace, uh, having graduated from my PhD in electromagnetics, uh, worked on the design of all of Australia's national satellites, uh, which uh, today owned and operated by Optus. And uh, I know quite a few of you here tonight will um, probably have Telstra phones and more than happy to pray with you after the meeting. No, no, just kidding. 
Um, but it's uh, it was a great and very blessed career. I was, uh, you know, working in aerospace is a, was a lot of fun. But I just felt that after uh, having done that for some 30 years, it was time to uh, to move on and look at other things that were more challenging and perhaps uh, more interesting. And I certainly find that now um, speaking on behalf of Creation Ministries International. So in the session tonight, I want to uh, address four different areas, which uh, I think, Kevin, you sent out in your email. Um, and the first is really, what is the core issue in the creation evolution debate? What's it really all about? Then to look at what is the role of science in discovering the truth about our origins. Um, then we'll take a look at some astronomical evidence in uh, various areas, our solar system, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, exoplanets, and if we get time, touch on distant starlight. And then I want to bring it all together, though, by addressing why the issue actually matters, because that's all about the gospel connection. And so really, it to me is, is about a quest for truth. So we all want to know what the truth is and discover truth. Um, no one wants to live in accordance with a lie. And Jesus was very explicit. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is really the personification of truth. Truth, rather than being some sort of uh, vague philosophical concept, is really ultimately in the person of Jesus. And uh, when he was challenged by Pilate, um, Jesus replied, in fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And he went on and said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So once again, his whole earthly mission was about the proclamation of truth. In the Gospel of John, we read in the very beginning, in the beginning was the word. Uh, the word was with God and the word was God. And the logos, the word, is linked to Jesus. So the Bible is, if you like, the words of Jesus or the words of God. And Jesus prayed in John, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So it seems to me that the Bible is our ultimate source of truth. And in fact, in 2 Timothy, you'd be familiar with this scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I conclude from that that the Bible is really the only trustworthy source of truth, and it's truth in every aspect of life. And in particular, our history, how we came to be. It seems to me that if God had not given us his word, we would actually have no way of discovering the truth about our origins. So the Bible says right at the very beginning, and uh, quite straightforwardly, that God created the entire universe in just six normal length days, just like the days we experience now. And uh, importantly, of course, it begins by saying, in the beginning, God. So the Bible establishes a causal agent for this space-time universe in which we live, and that is that supernatural creator, God. It then goes on and gives a, a series of what you might call chronogenealogies, that provide a timeline from the creation through to later stages in the scriptural account. And what's important about the chronogenealogies is that they give the age of the son, uh, sorry, the age of the father when the son next in line was born. And uh, by straightforward addition, you can conclude that the flood would have occurred 1,656 years after the creation, and also that Abraham was born about 2,000 years after the creation. And we know that from Abraham to the time of Jesus was around 2,000 years, and from Jesus to around now is about 2,000 years. So we find that the Bible um, points to the age of the universe from our perspective as being about 6,000 years after creation. Now, that's a, a pretty stunning position to try and take in this day and age, particularly as we are so steeped in the evolutionary story, which has, of course, billions upon billions of uh, years of history. 
In fact, um, I remember once uh, I was asked to speak at a church, um, actually it was in Adelaide, and uh, as I came up to the podium, the pastor turned to me and said, I just want to ask Dr. Harwood one question. Uh, do you believe the earth is old? And uh, I got to the podium and said, well, yes, I do. And there was uh, a bit of a, a gasp around the congregation, expecting, not expecting a CMI speaker to say such a thing. And I said, well, you know, if you think about it, anything which is about 100 times older than I am is very, very old. I mean, my children call me a fossil. You see, young and old are, of course, uh, relative terms. And for that reason, I don't particularly like the idea of old earth or young earth. Um, I believe that I base what I'm saying and, uh, and, and what I believe on what the word of God actually says. So I prefer to use the term biblical creationist rather than a young earth creationist. But is um, all this just a matter of interpretation of the text? And uh, this question of what does Genesis mean was put to a professor of Hebrew, James Barr, who at the time was the Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford University. And uh, that's not a position that you win in a raffle, right? This guy knows his Hebrew. And he said, probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 to 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that Creation took place in a series of six days, which are the same days of 24 hours we now experience. Um, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition, a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story, and that Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguish all human and animal life except for those in the ark. So it, it's not that the Bible is actually hard to understand, but rather it is hard to believe, particularly in our Western culture, which, of course, is steeped in the evolutionary story, um, which says that 13.8 billion years ago, there was a big bang and uh, we had uh, cosmological evolution. Then we have uh, geological evolution and then chemical evolution and then biological evolution and human evolution finally leading to mankind relatively recently uh, here on the face of the earth. I used to wonder why did these vast periods of time uh, originate, but the reason they're needed is that we limit ourselves to naturalistic explanations for our origins. In other words, things that just happen naturally. So consequently, we need massive amounts of time to account for the extraordinary complexity in our universe. But interestingly, if you think about it, when we limit ourselves to naturalistic explanations, we are excluding right at the outset the very prospect of a supernatural explanation. So what evolution is actually trying to do is explain the universe without God. Now, I'm not trying to set up a um, some kind of false dichotomy here. I know that uh, many Christians, um, including people on this meeting and myself in the past, believe that God used evolution. But it's the roots of evolution that I'm trying to get at here. So the foundational assumption of evolution is that there is no God. Naturalism, if you like, that's what drives the desire to find a natural explanation for everything we observe. So if you like, evolution is... Um, atheism disguised as science. So it's not so much about science, really, as it is about a belief about the past based on uh, there being no God. So what actually is science? And um, it wasn't until, interestingly, that I did a post-grad course on the history and philosophy of science that I actually came to understand some of this. And this, I think, is, is key to coming to terms with what appears to be the overwhelming evidence in favour of evolution. And uh, there are really two kinds of science. There's experimental science or operational science, which is what gives us our understanding of how the universe works, and we use that to develop all kinds of amazing technologies, et cetera, uh, like computers and so on, the fact that we can even hold this meeting remotely like this. But Experimental science is based on observable, repeatable experiments, things that can be seen and observed. 
but there's another kind of science, you could call it historical science. And historical science seeks to reconstruct what happened in the past that has led to what is being observed in the present. Now, like this guy looking at the fossil in the rock and uh, now, when a scientist makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing, so what, what, what happens, and this is inevitable, is that he engages his beliefs about the past. So as this guy looks at this fossil in the rock, if he believes the evolutionary story, he may well think, you know, I wonder where this little creature fits in that long, slow progression from the first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me. And I can imagine him thinking, uh, how many millions of years ago did this little creature live? So I hope you can see that what he already believes about its origin influences the story he tells to explain what he's observing. So historical science is influenced by what the observer already believes. So just by way of summary, experimental science is about the present observable and repeatable science, but historical science is about the unobservable and unrepeatable past. And interestingly, it's only in this area of historical science that there's any conflict between the Bible's record of history and, uh, and, and science. And there's no wonder there is a conflict because one version of history begins with the assumption there is a God and we build an explanatory framework based on that assumption. The other begins with the assumption there is no God and attempts to build an explanatory framework based on that assumption. Now, this distinction between experimental and historical science is not just the invention of biblical creationists. Um, in fact, let me share this quote from Ernst Mayer who is a very famous evolutionary biologist, he said, evolutionary biology in contrast with physics and chemistry is an historical science. The evolutionist attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques for the explication of such events and processes. Instead, one constructs a historical narrative consisting of tentative reconstruction of the particular scenario that led to the events one is trying to explain. Let me give you an example of how this works. Let's say that um, you uh, had uh, come around the corner into the backyard of your uh, house and there in the garden is a bucket partly filled with water under a dripping tap. Now, because you uh, are scientifically inclined, uh, you can't help yourself and you measure the rate at which the tap is dripping and the volume of water in the bucket as you do. So let's say the tap is dripping at half a litre per hour and there are six litres of water in the bucket. And you ask yourself, how long has the bucket been under the tap? Well, look at that, you might reasonably conclude, well, 12 hours seems pretty reasonable based on your measurements. But let's imagine that there was an honest eyewitness in your backyard who's been faithfully recording all the events and they give you a document that says the bucket was placed under the tap at 10 a.m you came around the corner at 12 at 2 p.m so how long has the bucket been under the tap well obviously four hours so how do we reconcile the historical record with what we're observing in the present well there's a number of ways you might think ah I didn't see the bucket placed under the tap. So maybe it was already partly filled with water. That would account for the discrepancy. In fact, if that was so, I could even calculate how much water was in the bucket when it was placed under the tap. Or maybe the drip rate hasn't been constant. It was uh, running quite fast initially, but it slowed right down. Um, there's any number of ways in which you can uh, develop various assumptions to modify or at least to be used in the calculation uh, of the observations that you make but you see science cannot determine which option is true because we can't go back into the past to make observations in fact by changing your assumptions you can get any answer actually that you like so i guess that the message here is that observations made in the present cannot determine the age of something or specifically the past so age can't be measured. Age, um, I mean, scientists measure the physical and chemical properties of samples 
you can't measure the age. Ages are always calculated, but they're calculated um, and the results depend upon the assumptions that are made. And assumptions about the past cannot be verified because we can't go back into the past to see if uh, they were in fact valid at the time or if there's been some other influence uh, on the phenomenon that we are observing. Importantly, the assumptions we make reflect our a priori beliefs. Really, the only way we can determine the age of something is through a reliable historical record. So it's a little bit like the, uh, the scene of the crime, you know, how do we uh, really get to the answer of the scene of the crime? If there was an eyewitness who was reliable, then their testimony would carry a lot of weight in uh, determining the guilt or innocence of the accused. And I believe we have an eyewitness account, and that's the history book of the universe, which is the Bible. You see, the Bible is God's eyewitness account of what he actually did right from the very beginning. So whilst science cannot determine the age of the universe or the past, the history book can. And God does not lie nor does he mislead. And I believe he's explained and um, imparted the, the truth about the past in a very clear way. So to me, science has what you might call a ministerial role to the scriptures, but definitely not a magisterial role. So we can't use science as the benchmark with which to test the scriptures. If we did that, that would elevate science above the scriptures. Rather, it's the other way around. We take the historical record of the scriptures and use that as the basis for interpreting the world around us. So scientific evidence is equivocal on origins. This uh, quote was from uh, a man who wrote an interesting article on uh, the various forms of science. And he said, the Genesis account of creation may even be the correct one, but there is no way science can prove or disprove it and the creationists know it. You see, only scripture can be the arbiter of truth, since the Bible is God's eyewitness of what actually happened from the beginning. So when we debate the scientific aspects of the origin of the universe, particularly the age of the universe, uh, I think we risk being sidetracked, if you like, camping around the wrong fire, because we actually need to look at what the eyewitness account says happened and use that to inform our science. So let's have a look at some uh, astronomical evidences um, that we can see in the world around us. And uh, I want to start off by looking at the Earth-Moon system. I love this photograph and it, it's not a collage of images, it's an actual photograph taken from the Galileo spacecraft uh, seeing the Earth and the Moon in the one frame. Absolutely magnificent. Now, it's curious, I was used to wonder, why is it that we only see one face of the Moon? I, I, as a young man, I think, isn't it incredible? The rotation rate of the Moon on its axis exactly matches the orbital period, and uh, so we see only one face. Surely there'd be some drift over time. Well, in fact, it's not just a case of being cleverly matched, one side of the moon always faces the Earth because the moon is actually mechanically or tidally locked. And the way that works is like this. The Earth exerts a gravitational potential across, or gradient rather, across the moon. Parts of the moon closest to the Earth experience a slightly stronger gravitational force than parts further away. And that has the effect of elongating the moon slightly, so it becomes a, an oblate spheroid. And that means that if the moon tries to turn away, there's a resultant torque that turns it back. Now, interestingly, that also applies to the Earth. So the moon creates a gravitational gradient across the Earth. The Earth also is not rigid, so it slightly distorts. So as the Earth spins, there's a resultant torque that slows it down. Now, the bulge is ahead of the Earth-Moon line because of the rotation of the Earth. So this breaking is a relentless 
breaking process and uh, the earth is continually slowing down. Um, interestingly, just a, a minor uh, sidetrack here, the angle that the moon subtends at the surface of the earth is almost exactly the same as the angle that the sun subtends. Um, so they look to be virtually identical in size, which means, of course, total solar eclipse are possible. Um, the path of totality, the shadow that passes across the face of the Earth is, is very small. Uh, and if the, Earth, the Moon sorry, happens to be at the apogee of its orbit, then it doesn't quite touch the Earth. And we have what is uh, called an annular eclipse. But this is a fascinating photograph. It shows the shadow of the Earth in a total solar eclipse passing across Mexico. Now, ancient eclipse records show that there was um, an eclipse in uh, Babylon around 360 BC. And uh, it's interesting, if you take the Earth's rotation rate at what it is today and roll that backwards to 360 BC, you find that the line of totality would have missed Babylon. There would have been no eclipse recorded. Um, in fact, the cumulative difference between the uh, the spin rate, which would have been faster in the past and now, would have been somewhere in the order of four and a half hours. So the ancient eclipse data confirms what we know to be the case, that the Earth's spin rate was indeed higher in the, in the past. But this slowing down of the Earth has an effect on the Moon because the uh, loss of angular momentum in the Earth is transferred to the Moon, which accelerates the Moon in its orbit. So the orbital energy of the moon is increasing, so it spirals outwards. Uh, interestingly, it's moving out at the rate of uh, about 3.8 centimetres a year. And we know that because the Apollo missions left corner reflectors on the surface of the moon. So by firing high-powered lasers at the moon, uh, you know, corner reflectors like the, the cat's eyes on the roadway, your headlights reflected back uh, towards you no matter what angle uh, the, uh, the light is incident. So the corner reflectors uh, reflect the laser beams back and uh, scientists can make very accurate measurements of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Now, the Moon could never have been closer in the past than what's called the Roche limit. And the Roche limit is uh, the point at which the gravitational potential across the orbiting body would be so great that it would be torn apart. So if we allow the moon to go all the way back to that point, it turns out that that would have occurred just 1,500 million years ago. Um, by the way, the relationship uh, in that recession is, is not linear. Uh, it's strongly dependent upon the, the distance, uh, it goes as the sixth power. So it varies very rapidly initially and then tapers off. But Having the Earth-Moon system with a maximum age of one and a half billion years is, of course, a problem for the evolutionary story. So this uh, evolutionist observes, a dissipation of tidal energy causes the Moon to recede from the Earth. The currently measured rate of recession implies that the age of the lunar orbit is 1,500 million years old. But the Moon is known to be four and a half thousand million years old. Consequently, it can be argued that prolonged periods of weak tidal dissipation must have existed in the past. Now, it, it's interesting to note the thought process here. Notice the phrase, the moon is known to be four and a half billion years old. Well, I would question that, is it? I mean, that is what the author believes is the case. And uh, so he has a problem because the evidence which he's observing in the present when wound backwards is discordant with his belief. So he concludes, well, there must have been some much weaker uh, tidal dissipation process in the past. <clears throat> and um, so there are, uh, I guess, rescue mechanisms engaged here that to try and uh, preserve the believed age. Um, the Earth-Moon system, uh, I've said that, uh, it's proposed that the energy dissipation was lower in the unobserved past. Various uh, options have been proposed. Ocean resonance is assumed to be larger today because of the distribution of the continent, continents. Um, that would lead to unusually high dissipation rates. So 
maybe the earth is slowing down a lot faster now than it was back in the past. Uh, people have proposed a uh, globally open ocean with no north-south continental barriers, only equatorial land masses. Um, and, and that would give lower friction and therefore less energy dissipation. But can you imagine the currents that would circulate without north-south continents? I actually think it's by God's grace that he's given us the Americas and the Europe-Africa uh, link that, that prevents um, uh, east-west clear passage all around uh, the earth. But the point is that the, uh, oh, and by the way, the plate tectonics models uh, don't actually support any of these configurations. But the observed lunar recession rate is actually consistent with a recent creation. So a very simple explanation would be, well, it just isn't that old. And in fact, the Bible would definitely tell us that the creation was only a matter of thousands of years old, not billions at all. Let's look at the solar system. I want to just touch on a few uh, quickly here. Uh, Ceres is the largest of the asteroids. NASA has a spacecraft called Dawn, which has been orbiting Ceres since 2015. There's a massive volcano on it called Ahuna Mons. It's an icy mud cryovolcano that appears to have erupted relatively recently. Now, if Ceres was formed when the solar system was formed, that means it would be four and a half billion years old. How could there be any residual heat in the core of such a small object to drive the volcano? And the uh, lead scientist in this particular study said, our main question is, where is the heat coming from that can mobilise these materials? Frankly, we, we don't know the answer. But it's quite consistent with a recent creation. It doesn't prove a recent creation, but it's consistent with it. But inconsistent with the idea that Ceres is, uh, is a vast age. The moons of Jupiter are quite fascinating. Back in 2018, 12 more moons were found, bringing the total to 79. Uh, there's been some recent talk about the possibility of even some extra ones. But in this chart, I hope you can see uh, there the, uh, the blue or the purple ones are the Galilean moons close in. Um, and the, the blue ones, these are all prograde. That means they orbit uh, Jupiter in the same direction as which Jupiter itself rotates. Um, there's a whole bunch of them further out that are retrograde. They go the wrong way around Jupiter. And uh, the brighter uh, orangey pink ones there are the 12 recently discovered. And they're all retrograde except for one, which is that green orbit. And that's the moon called Valetudo. It has a prograde orbit, which crosses the retrogrades. And uh, the, the researchers said, unlike the group of inner prograde moons, the new prograde Balatudo has an orbit that crosses the retrogrades. Uh, by the way, how does a planet like Jupiter have retrograde moons in a cluster like that if the nebula hypothesis or the formation of the solar system is true? And in the article, they went on and said, this is an unstable situation. Head-on collisions would quickly break apart and grind the objects down to dust. So how can Jupiter's moons be millions of years old if inevitable head-on collisions would quickly destroy them? But it is consistent with a recent creation. Now, one of those Galilean moons is Io. Quite a spectacular moon. It's uh, the closest one in. This is a marvelous photograph. It shows you the uh, uh, Io transiting Jupiter, and you can see the shadow on the surface of Jupiter. Now, Io is a wildly uh, volcanic place. It was observed by the Galileo spacecraft. It has huge volcanic eruptions on it. Um, that uh, volcano there, Loki, sent a plume 400 kilometers above the moon's surface. If Io had been erupting over four and a half billion years, at even 10% of its current rate, it would have erupted its entire mass 40 times over. Now, although it's only a quarter of its diameter, to release, it, it releases um, far more heat energy than the Earth does. Now, tidal dissipation can only account for about one-tenth 
of the heat energy of Io, from which it's reasonable to conclude that Io can't be billions of years old. But it is entirely consistent with a relatively recent creation. Back in 97, the Cassini-Huygens mission was launched to Saturn, a very successful uh, project. It uh, ended its tour of duty in 2017 um, after some 20 years. I had the privilege of seeing the Huygens probe uh, under construction at Hughes Aircraft Company's facilities in California when I was uh, working there in the aerospace industry. So the Cassini program came back with some remarkable results. After four and a half billion years, Saturn's rings should have accumulated lots and lots of dust. Yet the ice in the rings is remarkably clean compared to the predicted contamination from billions of years of micrometeorite pollution. So they're, they're bright and clean, but they're also dimming rapidly, such that they can't have been around for four and a half billion years old. The faint rings are also being perturbed by the nearby moons, which means they are starting to be broken up. None of these delicate rings seem likely to persist for even a tiny fraction of the lifetime of the main rings, and the main rings already look young. So the secular community by and large accepts that the rings are young and they're decaying rapidly, and uh, they're faced with the prospect that we have this astonishing coincidence that we just happen to have arrived on the scene at just the right time to be able to see Saturn's rings as they appear briefly and then will disappear. But I think a better explanation is that the rings are evidence of the creative genius of God, which gives him all the glory. I've often wondered, can you imagine how Galileo would have reacted as he turned his telescope to Saturn and was greeted by such an extraordinary sight. Now here's a fascinating little guy. This is an asteroid which is uh, orbiting beyond Saturn. It's about 250 kilometers in diameter and it was found to have a double ring set. But such small rings would disappear after just a few million years. And uh, in the, uh, the paper reference there, they say the age of the rings remains a mystery. Over the course of a few million years, the small pieces of a ring system should spread out. Because they are still contained as a ring, the authors concluded that either the system is very young or the asteroid hosts a small moon that shepherds and confines the particles in their orbit. And uh, Joseph Burns, the lead scientist, goes on and says, shepherds are the preferred and basically only explanation. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Um, being very young is a possible explanation, but he dismisses that because it does not fit the evolutionary paradigm. So the shepherds have to be the explanation. But, he goes on, Saturn's and Uranus's rings have many gaps where we should see shepherds and we don't. Something is missing in our understanding. And I would suggest indeed there is, because they're starting with a naturalistic perspective. If you like, there's no God. We therefore have to explain everything in natural terms. But it seems to me that God created the heavens for his glory. While we're on the topic of moons and planets moving a little further out, the tiny moons of Uranus are doomed to collide. There's a cluster of 13 moons that are very tightly spaced uh, close in to Uranus. Their orbits differ by just 10,000 kilometres, which means they're passing each other fairly slowly and very closely, so they're going to interact. The researchers said in only about a million years, Cressida and uh, will probably strike Desdemona. A similar fate awaits the moon Cupid and Belinda which will hit each other. So once again, the inner moons of Uranus could not have been orbiting for billions of years. But that is consistent with a recent creation. Now, Pluto had uh, a visit from the New Horizons spacecraft back in July of uh, 2015. 
But way back in 1988, it was discovered that Pluto had a, has a thin atmosphere and researchers have been pondering how it's managed to stick around. The surface is so cold that what little gas exists should freeze and just fall to the icy surface. Not only that, calculations also show that the ultraviolet part of sunlight, although very weak, should be energizing the atoms of gas to escape velocity. So both mechanisms should have depleted Pluto's atmosphere long since. However, it's still there. And uh, quoting the paper, the atmospheric loss must be thousands of times less rapid than predicted. Now think about that. These guys have developed very good theories based on experimental science, laboratory experiments, the physical parameters that they've used to do the analysis, but they're thousands of times out, orders of magnitude wrong. 500 tonnes of nitrogen are escaping per hour from Pluto's atmosphere. But perhaps Pluto is not billions of years old. You see, such a phenomenon is consistent with a recent creation. Pluto's moons. Typically, the small moons end up, as we've discussed, with tidal locking, locked in spin rates that match their orbital periods. Uh, that's the norm with the satellites of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, but not so with Pluto's small moons. As a result of the flyby, we now have a lot more information about the moons of Pluto. And this is uh, a NASA animation showing the moons. You can see Pluto and Charon there in the center in tan. They're tidally locked to each other. The white dots are showing that the common face looking at each other. But the rotation rates of the moons are very interesting. Styx, the red one, goes around once every three and a quarter days. Nix in yellow goes around once every 1.8 days, but retrograde, it's spinning the wrong way. Kerberos is green five days, but look at little Hydra, it's screaming around once every 10 hours. Now, there's a problem here because the moons are unlikely to be billions of years old because tidal locking mechanisms would have slowed them down by now. Not only that, because these guys orbit a binary pair, as it were, the gravitational potential is, uh, is variable and that produces somewhat chaotic orbits. And ultimately it's expected that those moons will um, lose their orbit lock into uh, Pluto and Charon. But what we observe is consistent with a recent creation. In our solar system, we see short period comets. Short period comets orbit in approximately less than 200 years. They're typically a few kilometers across, um, one to 10 uh, on, on average. So comets disintegrate rapidly with each pass by the sun. So they should only last for 10 to maybe at most 100,000 years. So if the solar system was four and a half billion years old, then all the comets should have disappeared by now. The mere fact that we have short period comets is consistent with the biblical timeframes. Now, as I said earlier on, you can always tell a story about the unobserved past um, to explain what you're observing in the present. So the evolutionary story is that uh, surrounding the solar system, there is a group of objects called the Kuiper Belt ranges between 30 and 100 astronomical units away, and uh, various objects have indeed been observed in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, but they're all large, uh, too large, in fact, to be short period comets. Some KBOs are as big as our moon. But it is believed that small KBOs must exist in sufficient numbers to continually supply the solar system with short period comets. Well, that struck a rock with the uh, flyby of New Horizons. In early 2019, the photographic images of Charon were published and it was astonishing that, they, that the surface of Charon has very, very few small craters. So the observed KBOs are too large to be short period comets but the lack of small craters suggests that there are too few small KBOs to be the source of short period comets. 
Now, there's no known mechanism for small craters to be removed and not the large ones. And Sharon is geologically inert, so it should provide a very stable record of impacts. So as a consequence of the New Horizons flyby, there is now no known naturalistic source of short period comets. But short period comets are not inconsistent with a recent creation. Now surrounding the solar system, there is a uh, putative Oort cloud, which attempts to explain the existence of long period comets. However, the Oort cloud is undetectable now, remember, science was about observations. So this is a, a, a purely a speculative solution for the source of long period uh, comets. Uh, there was, by the way, a, um, a very uh, a, a paper which demolished Oort's idea, uh, published in the Astrophysics and Space Science Journal. Um, but it's unobserved. So let's move on now quickly to the Milky Way galaxy. Um, the search for Earth-like planets, which was to determine how common Earth size and larger planets are in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. Um, and of course, you understand the logic of evolution is true. Life has evolved on Earth. Maybe it's evolved somewhere else. Uh, as of about March of this year, there have been confirmed some 5,000 exoplanets. This particular chart I um, downloaded in 2018, so it's four years old, but the scatter distribution hasn't changed particularly. Uh, it's still essentially the same distribution. And we see here the solar system giants, and these are what are called hot Jupiters. So if you look at those, uh, the vertical axis there is the planetary mass with one reference to the mass of Jupiter. So some of those hot Jupiters are 10 to 20 times the mass of Jupiter, or sorry, not the mass, but the, uh, yes, the mass, the mass of Jupiter. But they orbit their star, their host star, um, or are, are closer to their star than Mercury is to the sun, um, less than a 10th of an astronomical unit. Uh, so these are hot Jupiters that are very close to their host star some orbit in days or even hours, uh, but importantly, they are being rapidly consumed in a very violent environment. But they're still there, so they can't be billions of years old. But they are consistent with a recent creation. Steve Vogt, um, an astronomer, observes that our solar system is not typical. We are now beginning to understand that nature seems to overwhelmingly prefer systems quite unlike our own. So our solar system is in some sense a, a bit of a freak and not the most typical kind of system that nature cooks up. But we're told that uh, exoplanets that are being found are confirming that our solar system is just a common or garden solar system. But this is definitely not so to the point where uh, this astronomer has said the discovery of thousands of star systems wildly different from our own has demolished ideas about how planets form. Astronomers are searching for a whole new theory. Not surprising, though, is it? Because the secular view begins with the assumption there is no God. Now, I'm just going to skip a couple of slides in the interest uh, of time here. And uh, I just want to touch on uh, globular cluster rotation just briefly. Globular clusters are collections of up to a million or so stars that are assumed to be very old, 10 billion years, with simple chemical compositions, and they're tightly bound together by gravity. Uh, M13 is such a globular cluster which orbits our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, due to these clusters assumed old age and fairly spherical shape with a strong concentration of stars towards the center, they have historically been viewed as simple systems. However, observations keep revealing surprising results. Theory and numerical simulations of globular clusters indicate that any central rotation should be erased on a relatively short time scale. Because these globular clusters are formed billions of years ago, we should expect that any rotation signature 
would have been eradicated by now. Well, what did they find? Here's uh, M31, for instance, sorry, M13. Uh, we see blue shifted uh, stars on one side indicating movement towards us, red shifted on the other side indicating movement away from us. The velocity variation is like minus five kilometers per second to plus five kilometers a second. In all the clusters that the team studied, the centers are rotating. This result is astonishing, team leader Fabricius says. We did not expect this. Globular clusters cannot be billions of years old. But friends, that's consistent, isn't it, with a recent creation. Spiral galaxy distribution is uh, a recent uh, study done by uh, University of Bonn shows that the standard Big Bang model doesn't predict what we observe regarding the number of late type galaxies like our own. Galaxy collisions and mergers should be common, resulting in elliptical rather than spiral galaxies. And the models fail to produce a sufficient number of disk galaxies, yet many are observed. Interestingly, the chance that the standard model could produce the observed distribution of galaxies is effectively zero. In the paper, they um, produce uh, a probability equivalent to exceeding 12.5 sigma standard deviations, if you will. That's like one chance in 10 to the 36th power, which to any reasonable person is zero. So they conclude either the merger history is not correct and thereby the standard model of cosmology is incorrect, or the time elapsed is not sufficient for the mergers to have occurred. Now, as a biblical creationist, I would entertain both of those options, but the point is the observed data is consistent with a recent creation. Now, just quickly, the subject of distant starlight. Um, you know, this comes up so many times, and uh, we had a recent paper on our front page a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I think I sent around the, the link, sent the link to uh, Kevin, who circulated it. And it provides a, a neat summary of the issue. Let me just try and condense it here. We need to observe that the creation week was a week of miracles. God was calling into being things that did not previously exist as he spoke them into being. Should we therefore expect to understand the mechanism of a miracle? Well, probably not. But it is sort of tempting to have a think about, can we figure out how it might have happened? And, uh, but, you know, we recognise a miracle because it overrides the normal laws of physics which govern the regular operation of the universe. That's how we know, oh, that was miraculous. But God, of course, is not constrained by the laws of physics that he instituted. So bear that in mind. We're talking about a week of miracles. God has created a vast universe in a very short time, according to his word, and we can see the stars even though they are at astonishingly large distances away. But nonetheless, there have been various biblical creation cosmologists who have put together some models to address the problem. And uh, the first class of those, the time dilation models, gravitational or cosmological, and the proposed mechanisms uh, there produce considerably more elapsed time in the cosmos than on the Earth during creation week. And I refer there to the work of Russ Humphreys and John Hartnett in particular, and you can find uh, their papers and articles on our website. So the general idea is that on day four of creation week, earthbound clocks um, in the space of one uh, executing one day um, in the outer reaches of the cosmos, cosmic clocks could have proceeded much, much faster in the case of, say, the large Magellanic cloud, 170,000 years could have elapsed and the, and the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years could have elapsed, uh, thereby providing enough time for the light to reach the Earth. Um, and there are a number of uh, those sorts of models. And uh, interestingly, John Hartnett has really uh, walked away somewhat from his model now. And one of the reasons is, and, and I agree with him on this, it seems to me that all the time dilation models are challenged by the fall because when we look at the distant stars and galaxies we see the effects of the fall that is 
the second law of thermodynamics is winning. Things are running down. So it's one thing to get the light to us through God stretching out the heavens in creation week. But how do we see the effects of the fall subsequently? Now, there's a, a relatively recent uh, proposal come from uh, uh, Jason Lyle called the Anisotropic Synchrony Convention. And uh, this is interesting because it recognises that we can only actually know the two-way speed of light, which averages C. So when we say that light travels from the sun to us in eight minutes, what we actually mean is that light would travel from uh, the earth to the sun and back um, in 16 minutes. We don't actually know what the one-way speed is. Now, if light travels away from us at C over 2, then it would travel towards us at an infinite speed, still preserving the average of C. Now, this kind of bends your mind a bit. I must admit, when I first heard this proposed, I rejected it outright. But that was because Einstein just assumed that light travelled the same speed in all directions, but he did recognise that there was nothing in the mathematics or the physics that demanded that. So what if, in fact, light does travel towards us at an infinite speed? We would definitely then be able to see distant stars instantly, and there would be no problem. But, you know, it's a bit disingenuous of the secularists to point the finger to the biblical creationist and say, ah, you've got a light travel time problem, because so do the big bangers. And it's called the light, sorry, it's called the horizon problem. And the problem is this, the cosmic microwave background is very flat, very uniform. The temperature is uniform, uh, smooth to one part in 100,000, which, by the way, was not predicted by the big bang. So for it to be so smooth, the temperature variations, which must have existed at the Big Bang, have been equalised through the radiative transfer of heat. But there hasn't been enough time to get from one side of the universe to another. And this is called the horizon problem. Now, the Big Bangers have proposed a solution to this. And they say that at some uh, point in an incredibly short time after the initial Big Bang, there was an epoch called the inflationary period. Now, it starts for no reason, it stops for no reason, and during it, um, physics works in reverse. Gravity repels matter instead of attracting it. Um, it sounds to me really like the ultimate in storytelling. So here is the inflationary period, uh, apparently right at the beginning. Now, Discover magazine ran an article on this, and they quote Alan Guth, who is the uh, originator of this uh, inflationary period, as saying the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. So the universe grew a million, 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 million times larger in a thousand million, 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 millionth of a second. I mean, that is superluminal. It's faster than the speed of light. And in Discover magazine, they ran this cartoon. And let me get this straight. First, there was nothing, and then it exploded. I like this quote from Martin Harris. You have to understand that first there is speculation. Then there is wild speculation. And then there is cosmology. But friends, why does all this stuff really matter? And I think this is really the nub of the issue, if I could uh, just wrap up on this. <clears throat> The Bible says we are to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And I would suggest to you that evolution is probably the greatest pretension in our culture that stops people from coming to know God because it seeks to explain the universe without God. How do people come to God, a God they are not even sure even exists? Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God, comes to him, must believe that he exists. I think this is a very significant stumbling block. CMI's materials have helped to demolish this pretension for many, many people. We get so many testimonies 
uh, of people who have been restored in their faith or have been brought to faith because they understand that the Bible is trustworthy right from the beginning. Now, I want to direct you to some of our resources. We have, of course, our website at creation.com. It's an absolute gold mine of articles and items of interest all aimed at um, encouraging you to believe that the Bible is indeed God's word and truth from the beginning. We also produce the Creation magazine, which is written for lay people. There are four issues a year, and it's a marvellous witnessing tool. You know, so many people use it to um, answer their children's questions, their own questions. They use it as a witnessing tool, giving it to friends. I raised, uh, well, my wife and I raised our four children on Creation magazine. All four of them went on with the Lord, praise God. So I'd commend the Creation magazine to you. Of all the books, uh, if you wanted to buy just one, I'd recommend the Creation Answers book. It answers over 65 of the most asked questions in 20 short chapters. Uh, an excellent resource, including a whole chapter devoted to the distant starlight question. This is uh, an excellent lay-level book on our created solar system. It collates a series of articles published um, in Creation magazine. If you want to dig a bit deeper into the problems, the holes in the Big Bang, uh, this book, Dismantling the Big Bang by Alex Williams and John Hartnett, is an excellent read, uh, heartily recommended. And uh, for Refuting Compromise, this was written by Jonathan Safety, and it looks at the key teachings of Hugh Ross and the Reasons to Believe ministry. And it shows where the teachings are uh, divergent from the plain reading of scripture and where indeed the science um, is questionable. I know Hugh Ross is speaking at this forum in two weeks time, but if you haven't read this book, I would encourage you to because you need to understand that um, there are very serious issues, I believe, and CMI believes, in the message that Hugh Ross is, uh, is promulgating. And a series of excellent DVDs by Spike Saris. Um, volume one is uh, on the solar system, volume two on the galaxy, and volume three on the universe. And we have uh, a wide range of videos which are all uh, downloadable from the website. So when you're leaving the store, just make sure you use this coupon code, MH, my initials, and the date 220526. And uh, that will give you a 20% discount, which will help to offset any postage costs. So why does all this matter? Well, the evolutionary story places death and suffering before mankind even appears. The Bible has it the other way around. It says it was Adam's actions that led to death and suffering. You see, if the Bible's correct, then death cannot precede man, which means evolution is impossible. And that was my personal experience, as I described earlier on. These two versions of history are totally irreconcilable. The Bible says, therefore, just as sin entered one man, uh, entered the world through one man and death through sin. Very clear, Adam brought sin. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, since death came through a man. Now, some people say, ah, yeah, but that just applies to the death of mankind. But it also applies to disease and suffering. John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus, remember? They wanted to know, or John wanted to know, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus said to them, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. You see, Jesus' ministry was to heal the sick and ultimately, of course, to redeem all mankind through the cross. He was undoing the effects of the curse. The last Adam undid what the first Adam did, which is to bring sickness, suffering and death into that once very good creation. And Romans tells us that the creation itself is uh, waiting in eager expectation to be liberated from its bondage to decay. So Jesus came not only to save mankind from death, but also from sickness and disease, and also to redeem the whole of creation. And that is the new heavens 
and the new earth. Just imagine what it would have been like in Eden. God declares all that he's made to be very good. And here's Adam and Eve in the garden. If evolution was true, if God used evolution, they'd be standing on layers and layers of rock showing death, disease and suffering. Is that very good? I don't think so. So the gospel that we have as Christians to proclaim is like this. God created an original perfect world, no death and no suffering. Those things are an intrusion to Adam's rebellion. But God is going to bring about a restoration, a new heavens and a new earth. Now, when I added evolution into my understanding, I had to take that top left-hand corner out of the picture. But can you see what happens now? God has created the earth full of suffering and death and disease. But the new heavens and the new earth are going to be a restoration, the Bible says. To what? More suffering and death? So if evolution's true, we're stuck on this decaying, rotting earth with no hope for the future. You see, we need to get the top left-hand corner back into our thinking. And that's what we find in the opening chapters of Genesis. Now, I think I will end just at that point, but um, I'd like just to quote Psalm 8, King David's response. You know, when he considered the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, he says, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? When we stand outside on a dark, moonless, cloudless night, away from city lights, the heavens are truly stunning, and they do indeed declare the glory of God. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing at that point and uh, hand back to you, Kevin. Okay, Mark, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. You, I think you've presented your argument quite clearly. Um, there's a huge number of uh, comments on the chat line, uh, so I won't walk through them, but um, um, I'll open it up and um, for open conversation at this stage. Um, I had prepared a whole pile of comments, but uh, I won't try to walk through them at this stage and just bring them up as the need arises. So it's over to the rest of the group to comment. All right, well, I will introduce a few points. Um, in the opening bit, um, you said that, um, or inferred that a lot of the um, scientific movement is biased towards an atheistic view. Um, and you seem to conflate seeking natural causes with naturalism. Um, a, lot, a lot of the scientists, or a lot of the scientists who established the scientific movement were Christians. And yet um, they were seeking natural causes. I don't think they were excluding the uh, supernatural at all. Uh, they may have allowed for it, but um, they are still seeking natural causes for what happened in the world, but they weren't atheists. Well, what um, I guess what I mean there is specifically in relation to creation. Um, so, you know, God invites us to discover how the world works. Um, it's why he gave us uh, minds to, in fact, in Proverbs, it says, uh, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to seek a matter out. Uh, we are invited to explore and discover God's um, um, brilliance and his glory in creation. Um, and that's what, that's what good science does. It makes observations of the present. We learn how the universe works. We deploy that in inventions and all sorts of things. But when we move into the area of... Um, of origins, that's that's different because, um, as I said, the creation week was a week of miracles. So to what extent can we expect to be able to come up with a naturalistic explanation of a miracle? And I suspect we probably can't really, although, as I said, it is tempting. Uh, tempting in the sense that God's normal modus operandi seems to be to be, you know, it's precept upon precept, line by line. So 
in the creation week and the first day, God obviously has established the uh, principles of physics, the laws of physics and so on. So maybe on the fourth day, he actually used those as he stretched out the heavens and created the sun, moon and the stars. Uh, what might that have looked like? And I guess that was the motivation behind uh, some of the cosmologies that various people have produced. So there's no real problem doing that. But where the challenge comes is where um, statements are made, particularly about the age of the universe, which are completely at odds with what the Bible says. And at that point, just like the bucket of water in the tap, um, I believe it's, uh, it's the historical record, the eyewitness record that trumps observations made in the present. Hmm. Ma, on that, um, and so Tom Daly here, and thank you for a nice presentation. Um, yeah, uh, I, I thought that was that was actually pretty well done and and uh, nicely put. Yeah. Um, uh, and some things I've been reading the resources on CMI and particularly about the cosmology. Um, I'm an IT dude, interested in AI, that sort of stuff. Right. Spent time in California, so I don't know if you worked over in that part of the world, but I certainly did as well. Um, but uh, you, you, you said about historical science, and then I felt the first three or four arguments, you were basically using historical science to justify your age conclusions. And wouldn't it be more prudent to, because I don't really care whether the earth is old or not. God was there in the, in the and in fact, I, I think, could, couldn't we agree Let's leave inflation theory out at the moment. Couldn't we agree that if, you know, God was counting down to quote William Lane Craig through T1, let there be light, that there is no light, there is no time, there is no matter, there is no energy. Potentially there are not even the laws of physics, potentially, right? And then God created. Well, can't we both agree that what, I mean, the secularist, the, the only thing that the secularist can do to avoid the supernatural event is to somehow propose an either eternal universe of some sort, right? So can't you and I agree, firstly, that whatever happened at the initial 13.7 uh, billion years ago or 6,000 years ago, it must have been supernatural, i.e. miraculous. Wouldn't we agree on that? Sure, sure. I mean, everybody believes in miracles. Um, you know, the universe was made out of nothing. But I guess the difference is for the Bible-believing Christian, uh, we have a miracle worker. God spoke it into being. But the naturalist has to say, well, nothing became everything all by itself without a miracle worker. And I would argue that's illogical. That's, that's just magic. And so, we would agree. We would agree on that. And yes, I'm just trying sure. to get to see if we can agree that there's there a was, different. Can three, I just, can I just interrupt you there, Tom? There was something you said yeah, right at the beginning. Sorry. Uh, of what you said, which I've now actually forgotten. I wanted to pick up on, but I can't remember it. Well, well, <laughs> so let, let's just conclude the second part. All right. It seems to me you're talking to either young Earth creationists and therefore Christian. Or old Earth and everybody and secularists, and it seems like you're equating young Earth with being a true follower of Christ, and and everything else with not being uh, a believer in miracles and supernatural. Can no, you, no, no. Could you clarify that for the moment? Yeah, I, I certainly will. Um, uh, look, I said at the beginning that I believe God used evolution to create for many, many years, twenty years, um, and a lot of people do. Very. But I guess the difference is um, that it's it's to me what it's what I what I ended on, and I guess I didn't really end very well. I wanted to say that the reason we hold to the position that we do is because of the gospel message. It's because the impact of long ages on the gospel and you're placing death and suffering before man in every model I've ever come across that talks about millions and millions of years. And um, if you do that, you're doing a number of things. I think you're um, impugning the character of God because you're saying 
he created suffering and death. That's what I was trying to get at with the three Earths picture um, in this uh, in this particular one. Let me. Um, I'm not sure I can bring it back up, but you know the one I mean, um, where I had the two Earths visible. There it is, and I'll share that if I can work out how to find the the share button. Uh -huh. There we go. Is that coming up now? Hopefully, it yes, should. it is now. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, this is the position that, uh, uh, that, that, that I held, right? That God used evolution to create. So he made the world with, uh, full of death and suffering and, and disease. Um, and what I was saying here is because the new heavens and new earth is a, uh, a restoration, then that means that's what the future holds. So it's a bit like um, this situation. So all we've really got is that. And when I said, you know, we're just stuck on this planet. Um, I don't mean that uh, we're not redeemed. Yes, we are, but it's a very confusing picture. Redeemed to what? And why was Jesus going around healing the sick when he apparently created the world full of sickness and disease? Um, see, none of those things stack up. And uh, as I said, for me, it was that revelation that you can't impugn God's character as... Um, and attribute to him uh, suffering and death. Let me just stop sharing that now. Yeah, so I, I, it's the gospel implications which uh, lead me to the view that an historical, uh, the historical record laid out in Genesis is tremendously important because without it, I, as I wondered as a young man, what was the point of the cross? Well, why did Jesus have to die? Why not just be transfigured into heaven? Why the cross? Adam's sin didn't bring death because it was already there. So why did God put his son to death in a brutal way on the cross? The reason he died physically was because Adam's sin brought physical death into the world. That's why he died physically, I believe. Well, death before the fall is uh, one of the big major issues that's uh, raised, and I acknowledge that. Mm. And um, our reasons to believe, friends, are... Uh, are going to speak and um, they'll be addressing that issue so i'll be interested to see what they say um but uh i think this meeting's primarily on the scientific well, issue rather than the theological one although um i actually think that the issue the core of the issue as i say in the beginning is not scientific you see you can tell any scientific story any scientific story about an observation you make in the present relating to the past um, and science cannot prove or disprove any of them that, like that, that was my first point. i'm sorry so that sorry to interrupt again Mark, but that but that was my first point asking you then went on to tell uh, a few historical science points to actually ah, make yes, that point. right. and, and wouldn't it be more it. prudent wouldn't it be more prudent to say look we actually don't know, and you make there are some good points there with the with dark energy, dark matter. With I think there's a lot about Minkowski and whether time, or whether there is a, 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 a an absolute time that if there's a God, there is an absolute time. It's not just all relative. There are some really big questions there. But to conclude a young Earth from them, I just feels. It feels disingenuous. It feels a an age of the gaps. Let's 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 take what we don't know and 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 posit God. It feels like we're making that mistake again. Really, I'm quite perplexed by that. Um, at the beginning, um, you'll recall I showed the chronogenealogies, which um, do exactly the opposite of what you've just said. Um, yeah, the chronogenealogies but... take you right from the creation all the way through to, to Abraham. Um, Can I make a point there, Mark? Um, yeah. I, um, we'll, we'll present it tonight, thank you. Um, the chromogenealogies, as you aptly put them, well, we also have in scripture where Jesus is referred to as um, the, the son of David, okay? And we all know that he wasn't the literal son of David, he was a great, 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 great grandson, or I don't know how many removed. 
So that one statement puts a big question over the whole genealogies that they were recorded um, in the Old Testament for me, because well, it's a, it's a Jesus title. was not the son of David. It, yeah. It's a title. It's, it's his kingly line. He was yes, I know. King. And also in, in, in those biblical days, um, a grandson could be considered a son. So you can have, we could have had um, a lot of um, generations that were missed in that genealogy. It's not, and I wouldn't be the first person to say it. A lot of theologians argue that point. Yeah, so, they do. Um, to they base do, everything but... on that, I, I think, is, a, is not good. Yeah. Well, the point of the chrono genealogies, though, is that um, the age of the father when the son next in line was born is given. So even if you did have uh, missing generations in there, let me just find how to share this again, if I can find the spot. Sharing keeps uh, moving on me. Okay. Um, those chrono genealogies, like, you know, there could have been um, a couple of um, children between Adam and Seth, perhaps. But the fact is, Adam was 130 when Seth was born, irrespective of other missing ones. So there are no gaps all the way down through to Noah. And in fact, all the way through, as uh, I think I said, through to uh, Abraham at um, around 2008 years. There's an excellent article on the website, our website, creation.com, that talks about how the Bible teaches a 6,000-year-old age for the earth, approximately 6,000. Um, and, you know, the, the gaps in the genealogies argument um, may work in other places, but I don't believe it works in the chrono genealogy simply because of the dates and the numbers that are given. Hmm. Um, this is out of sequence, but um, uh, it, towards the end, you referred to the one-way or two-way speed of light mm. and saying, all right, you can't prove that it's different between going one way from the other. Um, the speed of light can also be um, calculated from Maxwell's equations, from the permittivity and permeability of free space. <laughs> So uh, that would seem to indicate that it's same both ways. You can calculate the, the figure that you should get the speed of light. But um, uh, permeability and permittivity of free space is a constant. <laughs> uh, and so that would not vary in the two directions. Uh, yes, there is a, an answer to that, which eludes me just at the moment. I have thought about that. Um, What's interesting, though, is that the secularists themselves are debating this issue about an asymmetric uh, speed of light. So if that was as simple as that, then you wouldn't, um, they wouldn't be entertaining such a thing. Um, I know that that's been thought about. I'd have to take that on notice, um, mm. Kevin. I, I think I might argue with that. I think the secularists, you're absolutely right. We can't, because of the synchronicity of clocks, and because the speed of light is the speed of causation, right? We, we, we can't actually measure the two-way speed of light. It, it's interesting. I wasn't... I, I, I was one way. Oh, sorry, the one-way speed of light, yeah. Um, and, and I'd heard William Lane Craig talk on this before, and I don't... I, I hadn't really understood it till I saw a, saw a Veritasium podcast. Uh, it's a little channel I watch on YouTube, and mm. a guy does brilliant, brilliant science communicator. And, um, and I posted that on Facebook and I didn't understand why some of my secular friends got so hostile. I'm going, guys, this is just like, this is just a fact. This is just science. You can't measure. And in fact, I even pointed to the, um, I think it was special theory of relativity where uh, Einstein put it as a, a convention. So it was the, like the 1905 paper, I think. And uh, they got really hostile. It wasn't until I saw that the, read the, the link the other day that I understood that it was they saw the connection to young earth creationism and to and to faith. And I thought, ah, now I understand. But but then you've got to start discounting all of the other predictions. And I've been reading through since I got your links, whether it's redshift, gravitational lensing, the Hubble constant, Einstein's biggest blunder. Um, 
you, you've got to you've got to then take all of these predictions of predictions made in the take, case of gravitational waves a hundred years earlier. And you've got to say, you've got to find different special pleadings for each of those. And I find that very, very thin. I find it very, very unconvincing having read the, the, the speed of light is instant in the other direction. There's no reason that I can see apart from defending the Bible to actually make that assumption for the reasons, Maxwell equations that, that Kevin just raised. It's a. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. But there's just no good reason apart from defending, because I have a prejudice on not looking at the, the way the world is. But actually, I've got to trust the Bible, not Christ. I want to make a distinction there. But the Bible as being inerrant, then I've got to actually interpret the speed of light that way, and it seems very thin. Well, it, it's uh, like I said, when I first heard it, I rejected it, um, probably for similar reasons. And I'm not saying it's necessarily right. Um, that's the point about a lot of the proposals that creationist cosmologists put forward. They're saying, well, how about this? How about that? But don't forget, um, the big bangers really don't have an answer either um, to the light travel time problem. So it's... Um, what do you mean by that? Mark, because oh, if the, we, the, we uh, would share we would share a reticence on on multiverse, which may be true, and and inflation theory, which which is rejected by some of its creators, we we would share a reticence and, and big questions there. And and I think they're fascinating things. But but why would that influence the speed of causality, the speed of light? Why would we think that that light is instant in one way, except except the only reason that I can that, that I can see is to protect the biblical account because we're worried that we may have to change our hermeneutic. I don't think we're protecting the biblical account. I, my perspective is that you begin with the biblical account and you use that to interpret the physics of the world around you. Well, and well, if that's an that outcome, well, maybe that is an outcome. But in the, in the case of the inflationary period, um, as you rightly point out, there are a lot of um, yeah, cosmologists yeah, I, yeah, who, who won't have a bar I, of it. I think that's uh, thin as well. I think we could probably agree about that. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think this story it's, is it's, it's speculation. Mm. Yeah, I think this story. But, but let me ask you, though, if you're going to say, look, light has to be, if, if the best answer to distant starlight, right, is a, that, okay, we can't measure the one way speed. So it's got to be instantaneous in, in one direction, right? Then, then why interpret that literally that the seven day? Why not take part? I got I got Psalm one hundred and thirty six here, twelve, right? That when it talks about the Lord's right, uh, mighty God's right, uh, mighty right arm, He lifted Israel out, right? Well, why wouldn't we interpret that as physically His right arm? Why, like, why are we interpreting one one way and and literally in one we have we're worried about determining a different hermeneutic for that for that it seems to be it seems to be having it both ways oh look i, I don't think so that that's straightforward hermeneutics isn't it one is a figure of speech um, an anthropomorphism uh, there are lots of those throughout scripture um, but you know like the trees clap their hands we don't rush out trying to find hands on trees uh, it's a poetic expression but when you look at the literature in Genesis, it's, um, it's historical prose in those opening chapters. It's describing what happened. I quoted the, the James Barr um, analysis of the Hebrew, a Hebrew expert who sees no um, you know, poetic expression in there except for one verse in Genesis 1. Um, verse 27 is actually the only verse of poetry there. So its purpose is to lay down a sober account of what God did during the creation week. In fact, Jesus himself um, demonstrated his belief in Genesis. And, you know, remember he was uh, challenged by some lawyers um, concerning marriage. I just find the spot. And uh, he said, oh, wait a minute. Let me try and find it. And he 
he said, you know, haven't you read? Um, he created the male and female uh, at the beginning of creation. So if Jesus believes that Adam and Eve were made at the beginning of creation, not billions of years after the beginning of creation, and he, after all, is the creator, then it seems to me that that's a pretty good lead that the creator himself, I can't dislocate it quickly enough, but you know the passage I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's applying normal rules of hermeneutics. There's no special hermeneutic here. Genesis is prose. Magnificent prose, but prose, apart from that one verse of poetry. So when you find anthropomorphisms elsewhere or uh, expressions, Jesus, the son of David, the Brahman raised, uh, these are titles. Uh, these are depicting his, uh, in that case, his kingly line. Uh, it's not saying he was the offspring directly of David. That's uh, clearly not the case. I, I, don't, I really don't see a problem with those things. I think, I think those things are very easily understood. But can you understand from somebody who's uh, a Christ follower, and I'll shut up after this, somebody who's a Christ follower. You're fine, right? Tom, it's okay. Who, who's, very in these, in these, who's very interested in these questions. I see, I see here a difference in hermeneutics. I, I mean, maybe the question would be, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna channel Andy Stanley here. Um uh, you, you know, do we believe in the Bible? You know, for the first three hundred years of the church, it wasn't the Bible. Yet, yeah, that's where that's where the that's where the church grew, right? Do we believe in the Bible or do we believe in Christ? Now, I know that the only way we know how to follow Christ is because we have the Bible, right? Yeah. But 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 is our faith in the Bible or is it in the faith of a risen Christ? And it feels it feel that, and I know that's a theological question, and I'm not trying to bait you. But that feels like the fear or the, the, the issue that we, we have, and that's become a battleground which turns so many people away, which is why I'm asking. Turns people away. I don't, you mean, you know, let, let, let me just address your point. Um, the words of Jesus are the words that we have in the Bible. Yes. The, the, the very first thing I put up about the second slide, all scripture is inspired by God, all scripture. So if you're following Christ, you're following his words. You're following what the Bible says. I make no distinction between those things. So it's not like you're worshipping the Bible as a book on the one hand or Jesus as a person on the other. Uh, we're worshipping God hmm. and his word is the only way that we know anything about what happened in the past because it's a history book. So why would God deceive us? If he took billions of years to create through a big bang, why does he say to us multiple times that I did it in six days? Why in the fourth commandment on the tablets of stone does he write with his own finger for in six days? The Lord created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, which is a merism meeting the entire universe. Therefore, you observe six days and rest on the seventh. That, that commandment has absolutely no meaning unless the days were days. So we find it in Genesis 1. We find it specifically mentioned twice in Exodus, in Exodus 11 and Exodus 31. We find Jesus affirming that Adam and Eve were created at the beginning of creation, not billions of years after the beginning. And wouldn't he know? He, after all, was the agency of creation. So, and Jesus is not going to lie to us. So I follow Jesus and I believe his words. And that's what I read in Genesis, which is why I start at that point. So, as I was saying at the beginning, the issue is, what is our reference point? The reference point is truth. The only source of truth that we have is God's word. The only, you, you can't regard um, science as truth because especially when it's historical science, trying to reconstruct our origins because historical science is influenced by the beliefs of the scientists. So if you start with a naturalistic worldview, you are in effect excluding God from the creative process. 
that's no, where that, evolutionary story comes from. That's where I've got to dis, that's where I've got to ask that distinction again or highlight the distinction that we agreed on earlier that that um, a science and scientism scientism is just a great delusion. I'm sure we would agree about that. Absolutely. Um, but 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 you you you're you're um, again it seemed to be equating a uh, a different hermeneutic uh, um, and an understanding of science with secularism, and and that's certainly not my position. Well, anyway, I'll shut up. And let other people. I'll, I, I'll, I'll I, shut I, up for a minute. The the point yeah, I'm making is it is influenced by so. In my own journey, when I was a theistic evolutionist, um, I was influenced by uh, what is effectively an atheistic worldview or a naturalistic worldview, explaining the universe without God. Well, that, that's indistinguishably different um, from atheism. So your whole approach to the world around you is we can't even admit the prospect of a supernatural creator. You have to explain everything in natural terms. So when you do that, you're instantly up for vast periods of time. So that's why, as you would have seen in those multiple examples that I gave, the, um, the scientists regularly reject outright the suggestion that what they're looking at might be young and not old. I say, no, that's not right, because we know it's old, right? What they mean is they believe it's old because they start by assuming or limiting themselves to naturalistic explanations. In other words, that's no different from saying there is no God. <laughs> No, no, uh, that's the bit where we're disagreeing. But I'll, again, I'll shut up for okay. a moment. All right. Uh, I guess uh, I, uh, my view is kind of formed from I can grab a uh, pair of binoculars. Uh, if I'm up in Queensland, uh, far enough north, I can see the Andr Andromeda galaxy. It's 2 million light years away. And just common sense would tell me that the light uh, originated from there two million years ago <laughs> and um, there's nothing esoteric or great assumptions about it it just seems a matter of common sense so do you believe the opening chapters of genesis therefore are wrong um oh and i um no i i just just um Can't both be right. uh, well no it, it depends on your interpretation and um, um, like William Lane Craig says, uh, as far as theologians are concerned, there's numerous interpretations of Genesis 1. Now, I haven't looked into it. He, um, I've read John Lennox, and he kind of went through some of it. And um, I can't rec recall it all. <laughs> um, but uh, I think, the, for me, the uh, interpretation of Genesis is an open question. Um, but... Uh, as far as um, even uh, even if Jesus agrees with it, um, Jesus believed that Adam and Eve were made at the beginning of creation. Do you I, I appreciate that? what you what you're saying, um, but um, e even then, uh, you seem to hold a presupp presuppositional view on the scriptures, um, whereas um, you kind of st have a starting point that it's an errant word of God, and therefore it drives everything else. Um, um, whereas, um, well, I, I come to it, I actually um, have to make a judgment of whether I trust the Bible or not. Like, I don't ex uh, trust the Bible because it says it's trustworthy. Um, it's just the same as I wouldn't accept the Quran <laughs> uh, because of its own self-affirmation. And um, so... But so why not take the same view of the Quran as uh, if you're taking a presuppositional view? Well, the Bible, interestingly on that, is the only holy book that invites testing. Mm. The Quran, in fact, is um, you dare not question it. That's, that's blasphemy. But the Bible says, test all things and hold yes. on to that which is true. So God's, and he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Which means, so, among other things, that the Lord doesn't mislead you. So just back to what you said before, though, Kevin, if if your criterion is there's the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years, light years away, therefore it must have taken two and a half million light years to reach us. What if there was an explanation for that? Oh, tell me. That you don't know about. <laughs> that you don't know about. And uh, well, so, I think it's highly... 
imagine the scene. You stand before the throne room of God at judgment. Yeah. And you say, well, God, I didn't believe you did what you said you did in Genesis because of this problem. And God says, oh, that's simple. I did this and shows you. Mm. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be in that place. <laughs> I would far I, prefer to say I find that um, I believe God's not going to judge me. Clearly told us, Lord. God's Sorry, not going to judge me on my um, no, 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 don't my mean, views on those things because I, as a Christian, I'm washed for the blood of Christ, and yeah, I know. So you, I think we've got to be really careful about what we say um, in those yeah. types of things, especially in a public forum, which this can be watched. And you know, yeah. Christianity is about deliverance from death full stop and eternal life that's what we've got over every other religion and so do you um, believe that there was death before adam Bronwyn? i believe that i'm a see this is another problem i have with your stance is that anyone that disagrees with you you pl you plonk into the um you don't believe in the word of god well i'm a bible believing christian who actually just happens to have a slight little a slight change in view on what some of those words mean in in Genesis, like for example, the word the the word day uh, is used in a number of different ways to describe what's happening in Genesis. In Genesis two, it's completely different to what is it saying in Gen in Genesis one. So you c it's um it's the daylight hours, the whole day, like we say, you know, uh, today or the whole day. Or we say um, in the the in my father's day, okay. All those words um, have been used historically and are there in the Bible about what happened on that day. Adam was supposed to do A, B, and C. Now tonight is a discussion about the science, so yes. um, it's not really supposed to be going into that. But my point is that we all agree on the most essential things about Christianity. We shouldn't have hostility towards us, each other, on any of these things. Um, no. And, and I've, I, I take offence when, when someone says, you know, if you don't hold, a, it, unless you hold my view, you're not a biblically believing Christian. I actually believe the Bible is the word of God, but it's up to interpretation. And God oh. also has, as soon as I say uh, it's this, this is the way it is. God has a way of saying, actually, it's not. There's my experience in life. He he pulls the plug out on me and says, actually, it's going to be this way. So it's very dangerous ground to actually say, um, you know, that this is the only way to believe it. I think humility before God is far more important. And to say, this is an interpretation I have. This is what I say to my Christian friends, my non-Christian friends. This is an interpretation I have of the Bible. Other people, other Christians believe differently. The, the great thing about Christianity is that we can, Christ brings us from all different directions to his word. And the, the important thing is about the sacrifice of Christ. I don't think death before the fall has any impact on the gospel message because Christ says death came to Adam, not to the animals. So but that's for another night. So we'll try and get back to the science. Um, yeah, well, I, one I, thing about the Big Bang before I finish is that well, I, I just find need the to Big Bang. Respond. I, I, if I've yeah. given you the impression that uh, I'm implying you don't believe, um, then I apologize for that. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm mm -hmm. trying to point you back to what the Bible says. And, and, and it's not just me. I mean, the, the scriptures are fairly plain. Um, and uh, particularly about the origin of death. And that has a profound impact on the gospel message. And yeah, but that's death that to, to people, my own personal not experience. to animals. It's death. But see, this is going off the topic. Um, that's death to people, not death to animals. So, um, and, you know, oh, like, you can't box God in to say uh, a good God wouldn't do these things. Now, my life is in the hands of God, all right? Ultimately, my life is in the hands of God. But that doesn't mean I might, I might not suffer a terrible, a terrible death or someone love, close to me might go through incredible suffering. But I could, you could turn around and say, that means my, my God is not someone who is, uh, is a good God. No, I can't say that, all right? It, there's, there are a lot of paradoxes in Christianity, and that's, that's one of them. Of the fall, isn't it? 
no. But it's, it's not not he's God's allowing character. that to happen to me as a bible believing christian i could claim that christ should should right like he did in the old mm. test in the new testament deliver me from every single sickness but he chooses not to and it's nothing to do with what my belief system is it's a choice that he has placed on my life okay because as soon as you start pointing to say that you didn't have any belief i could say well Christ didn't even heal people that personally had belief. He healed people that didn't have anything to do with it, how other people were praying for them. So you can't box God in to a, he's only good if he, if we, he ticks all these boxes. So, um, yeah. Anyway, back to the science. The, the Big Bang for me, um, I, I grew up in a, in a young earth creationist home, and you talk about people having having a a background and a certain viewpoint. Well, I had that, and it wasn't until I was in my early 40s that I, or mid 40s actually, that I actually discovered that you could actually, um, the, that the, the account in Genesis can be read slightly differently, not hugely differently, just a twing to make it seem as though all the scientific evidence that we're getting sent our way actually matches. To me, God doesn't lie. and the science of the modern day should balance up with what God's saying. Now, the Big Bang, um, through uh, the, the scientists, a complete conundrum because they thought that they, for their um, evolutionary um, uh, paradigm to work, that they had to have an eternal universe. And then along comes the Big Bang, which showed that the Earth did have a beginning. And guess what? Which... which um, which um, creation doctrine talks about a beginning? The Bible. The Bible talks that in the beginning. So Genesis. So the Bible, uh, to me, speaks of the Big Bang. And then again, you can't turn any of the knobs. I won't try and talk about the scientific jargon, but you can't turn any of the dozen knobs in any direction in order to get a universe. To me, that speaks of the supernatural. And I've, I think I put down there on my, the chat a quote from, um, yeah, from... Uh, uh, Fred it? Hoyle. Yeah, Fred, Fred Hoyle. Fred. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And saying that... Um, I've got a couple of bits. Yeah. The fine-tuning of the Big Bang is, is astronomical. As astronomers would share, i.e. Fred Hoyle himself said, I do not believe that any scientist who examine the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nu nuclear physics have been deliberately designed. Now, that was done probably 30 years or 40 years ago, that quote, might have been more. And they oh, still yeah. are puzzled. <laughs> They're still puzzled. And it gets even more and more fine-tuned. So mm, when Christians does. turn their back on that, I find it's, it's, it's such a big evidence. I think we're doing ourselves a disfavour. And when I talk to non-Christians, and I'm surrounded by them, a lot of scientific non-Christians, I'm talking about the fact that in the, in, um, the Big Bang and other um, ast astronomical events, it's so fine-tuned that you cannot infer a creator. And you brought up the fact that there's a, not a protagonist, a, um, what's that word? the um, causal agent. It has to be a causal agent. And so everyone's mm. stumped at that point. So mm. um, I think Christians do themselves a disfavour when they, when they say the Big Bang didn't happen. So anyway. Uh, okay. All right, you answer, Mark. Oh, well, I just, I, I acknowledge what you're saying and I understand that, um, you know, Craig makes a great deal of the fine tuning of the of the universe, um, and uh, but I don't find anything in the Bible that supports the Big Bang. That's my problem. The sequence of events is completely different. Uh, the time scales um, bear no relationship to Genesis. Um, I just don't believe that you can patch the two together. Um, in which way, and you, you're stuck with the same old problem again about the, uh, um, you, you, as you you describe it, is in in the issue of the character of God, God's goodness. His, I mean, why would He not tell us that He took billions of years to create 
the Hebrew could easily have said, uh, I created the universe in as many years as there are grains of sand on the seashore. It's well, quite well, that, the capacity of the Hebrew to do that, but there's not even a hint from cover to cover that that is the case. So that, I just find it unsupported by scripture. That's an argument from silence, though, and that's a bit like our secular friends would say, listen, there's evil. God doesn't, I can't imagine an, a, a reason why God could actually allow evil and suffering. Therefore, there can't be a God. That, that's the same logic there, Mark. We, we want to avoid that logic. No, no, because, because God I, didn't. I don't understand that. Sorry. Billions of years, what, billions what, what I'm saying is that the text of the Bible doesn't admit a Big Bang process. That's basically what I'm saying. No, but it doesn't admit that God has reasons for allowing suffering either, right? Uh, and evil. And so, so. Well, it tells I us where it comes very, from, though, doesn't it? It's from Adam's rebellion, because before yeah. that, that was not the case. It's Adam's yeah. rebellion which brought suffering and death into the world. Yeah, but, the but the, clear on that, isn't it? we can agree on that, but I'm just saying you've mm. got to be very careful with your logic here because there's a double-edged sword. The, the logic you're using, right, I'm just commenting on the logic, the, the argument and the logic that you're using to say, look, God would have told us that the, the, if the world, if the, if the universe was billions of years old, is exact, and, but, and I can't think of a reason why he wouldn't have told us, is exactly what my secular friends say, look, there's evil and suffering in the world, and I can't think of a reason why there is, and uh, uh, so therefore, you know, um, therefore, therefore uh, there can't be a God. You, you've, you've got to be very careful of that logic. Uh, you, you have lost me, Tom. <laughs> I understand I mean, where he, I understand what Tom's saying. Okay, maybe you could explain it. I, I, I thought you'd say that. It. You see, I don't think it's a, <laughs> I don't think it's a, an argument from silence. Uh, um, the Bible's quite clear about what God did in creation, um, well, and it it does not match the Big Bang sequence of events by any means. Well, I, um, I think what well, the time well, lines, that's not silence. That's very explicit. Well, can I try and explain what I think Tom said? Sure. <laughs> um, what he's saying is uh, um, uh, God has not given us, uh, God doesn't actually explain his reasons for allowing evil. So he's uh, gone blank on that. And so um, why wouldn't he go blank on other things <laughs> and not tell us about it? Uh, isn't that, isn't that God? Yeah. Well, have I, have I? Yeah, well, Tom, have I represented what you were saying? Yeah, 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 yeah e exactly. And, yeah, and so Tom, I understood it. He created the world and he allows evil and suffering, right? He could do something about it, but he doesn't. We know how it came in. He has. But why God allows it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't actually matter. That's irrelevant to the fact of how it came in. We're all broken. That uh, Why does he allow, to quote Richard Dawkins, this little amoeba that gets into the eyes of kids and actually causes them to go blind. Like, let's just, just talk about excessive suffering. Now, now, what our secular friends say is they argue, and, and I'm just quoting on your argument from silence, that, oh, look, if it was true, God would have told us. If God, if, and because we can't think of a reason why God might have done it that way, he couldn't have done it that way, so therefore there can't be a God or it can't be true. I'm just saying your logic okay, is well, exactly I think, what I think you're misunderstanding, misunderstanding my logic. Um, what I'm saying is God has given us a clear outline of what he did. It's unambiguous and it's quite clear. Six days of creation, chronogenealogies, it's all laid out. It's not as though it's silent. What I'm saying is if the Big Bang was true, then God would not have misled us with such a clear framework. He could have said... I took as many years as there were, etc. In other words, it's it's within the scope of the Hebrew to describe the Big Bang um, in broad terms. Had that been the case, but you're he's making given us my very argument. specific you're making my argument, sir. and information to the contrary. So it's not silent. It's a very specific outline. This is what I did. So yeah. I don't believe we are free to then impose something totally different that does not fit what God has said. Let I, me, I, I'm quite baffled. I'm let, sorry. Me, let me pursue just on, the, on the argument of suffering. Can I just pick on that? Um, we do know exactly why 
death, disease and suffering is in the world. And that's Adam's sin. You say, why doesn't God do anything about it? He has done everything that it is possible to do without him withdrawing his, um, uh, the way he made us in his image. He could withdraw from us our ability to make moral choices and therefore be accountable for those choices. But he doesn't do that yet. But there is coming a time when he will, and that will usher in the end of the age, and the Bible says there will then be a new heaven and a new earth. But in the interim, we're in the already but not yet of the kingdom. But God has done everything that it's possible for him to do to address man's rebellion. We agree with a lot of that, but I'm not making my point very well to me because you are actually making my argument. Um, and and I tell you, the only reason I'm still talking about this is, is because of how many secular friends that I have and family that I have. And this is actually a really important stumbling block for them to hear the gospel, as is young earth creationism, by the way. Um, uh, so that that I, I will try maybe to summarize. Uh, do we have your email? Maybe I'll try and write. Yeah, this I've a got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, so I, rather you than hold everybody up because this is a little bit ancillary, this is about the logic and uh, uh, evangel uh, evangelism, and I don't want to hold everybody up on that. So. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of drifting into the Bible rather than scientific. But like at the end of Job, um, when God speaks to Job, he basically says to Job, you got no idea what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, that is that is so right, Kevin. I that that actually, Mark, do you want to yeah, how do you how do you process that with literal well, I, I think reading that, the Bible? It's a marvelous example of the power of the creation message, isn't it? Because when God turns up to Job, he simply describes the amazing creation that he's done. He's declaring himself as the sovereign creator God. And it puts the whole situation and thing into perspective. He doesn't address specifically the issue of why suffering, why not, all the issues that the friends had struggled with. Uh, he certainly hammered their flawed theology. If you do good things, you'll be blessed. If you do bad things, you'll be cursed. Um, but essentially, he laid out the doctrine of creation. I'm the creator God. That's essentially what he did. And that's why I believe the message of Genesis is so profoundly important. It's the foundation of the gospel. The reason Jesus died, the last Adam came to undo what the first Adam did. And without the first Adam in the story, you can make no sense, I believe, no, no real coherent sense of the act of redemption of the last Adam, what he did for us. And the first Adam's rebellion had to be in an environment of perfection. Otherwise, there's no point in Christ's physical suffering and death on the cross for us, nor in his ministry of healing, reversing the effects of the curse, which is a consequence of the first Adam's rebellion, not a consequence of how God created the heavens and the earth. So about a month ago, I spoke at Reasonable Faith on um, the all the biblical aspects of it and the hermeneutics, um, and looking at it all from that perspective, and looking again at uh, how the salvation message is meaningless if we don't understand the fall and Genesis as um, Max kind of described it tonight. Um, one of the issues there, though, is that it depends a lot on interpretation, as other people have said. Um, but however we want to interpret it. Uh, the intent of the original authors, uh, including that quote you mentioned tonight, Mark, from um, someone, Barr, I think it was. Um, James Barr, yeah. Yeah, James Barr, that the original authors intended it to be read as six literal days, as reading those genealogies as Mark described, and as a literal worldwide flood. Uh, that was how it was written to be read, uh, whether that was what how we want to interpret it or not is another matter, but that was the intent of the original authors. Yeah. So you're agreeing with that? Yeah. It was the intent of the original authors. Now, the reason people seek to reinterpret 
uh, is very often an attempt to incorporate secular views into the scripture. I'm just looking at evidence. Yes. Sorry? But I'm just looking at evidence and there is... Yeah, but you interpret um, evidence according to what you believe. People don't no, approach I'm, evidence... A true scientist, I think you're on dangerous ground when you say that because a true scientist will take look at the evidence um, and make an assessment. They won't be going, oh, just because this one, it has to back it up. They have to look at purely at the evidence. I'm not a scientist, but that's my that's what I remember uh, at high school. <laughs> that, that's what you you do. You look at the evidence and see what the outcome is. A true so, scientist will do their best to do that. But all of us, every single one of us, has our own biases, presuppositions, or whatever. They do, but, but that shouldn't that stop you from think. coming to a conclusion. If the conclusion conclusion is opposite, they should present it, and a good scientist will do that. Can I just say? Uh, tell a, a, a short story, we've gone way over the time by the way, uh, of uh, a discussion I had with one of my wife's cousins. He's a, a ge geologist and consultant and he's consulted to um, BHP and um, uh, up north and I forget it's near um, the dam, Olympic dam, Olympic dam. And so he has to actually uh, date various uh, sections of rocks um, because um, so that they can make choices about what, how to develop the site or, and on safety issues. And he has to go through extremely rigorous um, approach, make sure he gets his answer right. It's double blind testing and all sorts of things. It's about radiometric testing, which is off the topics, not astronomical. But uh, he made the comment, the worst enemy of science is ideology. And that works both ways. So if you actually come... Uh, to your science with an ideological assumption um, mm. you corrupt the science and mm. um, uh, and so and to him it's an extremely dangerous thing to do that uh, everybody so, does that's that's the problem Kevin yeah um, but he, he, there's he, no he, such thing as neutrality he has to get the answer right <laughs> mm, mm. or like because, engineers yeah. building spacecraft but you see yeah. that's the difference because when I work or worked past tense on communication spacecraft, you're doing experimental science. You're making observations, measurements, you make logical deductions. But that's not the same as historical science where you're trying to reconstruct the unobserved past, right? That's a very, very different classification of science. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about when we discuss origins, because none of us were there, none of us can go back, none of us can do experiments. Yeah, All we have is the eyewitness account that God has given us. Yeah, I, I agree with you that, that empirical science is far more reliable than forensic science. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, at this stage, I have to <laughs> um, um, uh, terminate the the uh, terminate the recording. Um, otherwise, I'll blow up YouTube. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> just to finish it off prior to the room, uh, recording, look, you're a really nice guy. You presented it um, well and in a very civil manner. And I hope this discussion has been uh, civil in your eyes as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, at this stage, I'll just terminate the recording.